Okay, this is chapter 11 from the book, How to Improve Blood Flow. That's the subtitle, oh crap, here we go. And the title, the title of the book is A Tale of Two Tubs, A Tale of Two Toes and a Hot Tub. Okay, so anyways, what we're talking about in this chapter is sleep. And you can represent the brain pretty easily with a hand. So the side of the hand, like a fist, is like the brain stem. Here's like the pond, you can put the midbrain up here if you like. But that's sort of your primitive reptile brain, which is just instinctual, you know, food, go for it or not. Okay, then right above that is what you would call the limbic system. And the limbic system, you know, like the letter C on a Chicago Bears helmet, and basically that's your mammal brain, your um, impulsive, quick, reactive brain. Um, so a mammal has to do all the things involved with raising a baby. You know, it has to nurse the baby, take care of the baby, watch out for the baby. So it's a much higher level of intellectual sophistication than a reptile. And then you can make the other part with a fist. By a fist, this is like the temporal lobe, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe. And the point is that the cerebral cortex is up here and that's, and especially as you go more towards the front, everything towards the frontal lobes is more delayed gratification, more what we would identify as human. Um, so the point is when you're sleep deprived, you're stressed out, relatively speaking, it's a stress equivalent. And stress pushes you into a sympathetic autonomic nervous phase, which basically means fight or flight. So that's in your limbic system. So you're more impulsive. Basically, when you're tired, you're more likely to get pissed off. You're more likely to say something rude that you're going to regret later. So it's good to sleep just for the reason that you'll get along better with people. You'll be less likely to mess up your relationships. Okay, and you'll be healthier because there's all kinds of negative things happen with stress and they happen with sleep deprivation. Not to mention, you know, you don't drive well, you don't do other things well. So, okay. Okay, uh, try to get six to eight hours a night. The thing I found most helpful is usually you're going to wake up at about the same time every day. So try to go to bed earlier. And when you go to bed earlier, you know, we all have families and our families are noisy and quite annoying. And they don't really care when we tell them to be quiet. So what you do is, there's a lot of things you could do. One of them is... You can just put on the heater, the air conditioner, so that continuous monotonous noise is a lot less annoying than the dog barking or the family members making noise. Um, I found that helpful many times. I get yelled at the next day for putting up the heater, but who cares? Um, what else? Some people put a like an air filter in their room to make a noise that distracts them from the noise of the house. Maybe. I don't really like that. Especially I don't like anything close and loud. I wonder if that's not good for your hearing in the long run. But I know some people have done that and been happy with it. It's good to wake up at about the same time almost every day. You know, you probably eventually get programmed for that. It also seems to be the case when people are young, like let's say college age, they really don't like getting up early in the morning. I remember when I was in college and there was a class I was supposed to take that started at 8 o'clock. And I remember thinking... You know, complaining to my friend, the university must be insane to have a class at 8 o'clock in the morning. Who would go to a class so early in the morning? That seemed like impossible at college age. Now I, now I get up earlier, much earlier, and feel good about it. Okay, uh, if you can, sleep longer on a non-work day. Get your sleep when you can, the extra stuff. Our melatonin system largely runs on blue light because that's what meant daytime to our ancestors. So basically, computers and phones give off blue light, so... Try to go easy on the computer and the phones at night. Um, if you have to get an alarm clock, get one with a red light on it. So it's less going to have less of an effect on your decreasing your melatonin, making it hard to sleep. In Las Vegas at the casinos, they keep the bright lights on. So you think it's daytime. You don't make melatonin. You stay up and gamble and lose your money. Um, let's see. Avoid stressful stuff at night. So yeah, don't do things unnecessarily stressful at night. Don't uh, watch the news. It's just going to stress you out. Don't... Um, you know, don't argue with, you know, rude people on uh, Facebook or anything else at night because it can stress you out and you'll toss and turn and think about that. Start winding your day down two to four hours before going to bed. It can take a while for your melatonin to ramp up. It's good to put low watt bulbs in your bathroom or any other spot you have to go late at night just so your less bright lights around you. You'll help you to get your melatonin higher, you sleep better. Um, what else? Um... In general, I kind of like a room that's cool to sleep, but there's a trade-off to that. I sometimes like a room now that's warm only for the reason that 
when it's cold, I have to wake up and void more often, especially if you're eating the OMAD diet, one meal a day diet, you're, and you're eating a lot of fruits and stuff and starches, you're going to be more likely to have to wake up and void more often. So I like the room kind of warm because I don't want to have to void more often, especially if I have to work the next day and I'm eating the OMAD diet. Um, otherwise, so I used to like it cooler. So you got to figure that out for yourself. Keep the room really dark so you can barely see the far wall. Uh, we're made to sleep at night. In general, you don't want to work the night shift if you can avoid it after 30 years of age. When you're less than 30, you got a lot more resilience. After 30, you know, I think it uh, tends to lead to health problems. People working the night shifts after age 30, um, especially after age 40. Even an alarm clock can give off a lot of light. We talked about that. Arrange the furniture so you don't bump into stuff. Yeah, it's like my daughter moved the furniture in my room, and uh, it felt like uh, like you know somebody played a joke on Helen Keller because I like to walk around in the dark. All right, um, minimize caffeine intake. The best amount is zero. I don't drink any caffeine. I think that's the best thing to do. It's bad for your health. It's a stress equivalent. It makes things worse. Uh, I certainly say none after 10 o'clock in the morning. At the most, two cups a day. Again, I think the best amount of coffee, the best amount of caffeine is zero. Um, I noticed I slept deeper after that, and people, other people have told me the same thing. Um, the half-life on caffeine is about six to eight hours. That's a long time. So even if you drink it in the morning, you're going to have some in your system in the evening. Um, avoid MSG. For some people, that can cause insomnia. Uh, go through your pantry and fridge and throw out anything with MSG. That's what I do. But basically, that's another reason for eating the whole food. Um, vegan diet. There, if you only eat whole foods, there's like no MSG in those. It's when you get to the processed food that MSG is added to almost everything. Monosodium glutamate, and that potentially can have an excitatory, it's an excitatory neurotransmitter, the glutamate is, and it could potentially uh, have an effect on your brain. Some people are more sensitive to it than others, but I think it's a good idea to avoid it completely. Avoid preservatives. Again, all this processed food is going to have preservatives in there that are potentially associated with hyperactivity, attention deficit, insomnia. Um, here's some listed that have been mentioned in that context. Uh, things like calcium propionate, sodium benzoate, sorbates, food dyes. The bedroom should only be for sleep and sex. Get the electronics out of the bedroom. No TV, no radio, no cell phones. Uh, sex especially helps a man to sleep. Men who do that more often have a lower risk of myocardial infarction. I told my wife she didn't seem to care that much. <laughs> Why is sleep so important? Because that's when your brain recharges itself with the glymphatic system. Uh, glymphatic stands for glial, the supporting cells of the brain, and lymphatic cells. So glial, lymphatic is condensed together into glymphatic. And it was only recently discovered that the brain even has lymphatics. And they're in the periphery of the brain. Okay, like in the dura. At night when you sleep, the extracellular matrix of the brain develops increased permeability. I'll show pictures of this. It'll make sense. I'll just go to the pictures in here of the glymphatic system so it'll be easier to understand it. Okay, here's a coronal view of your brain. It's like if you slice it from front to back. So here's the right side. You can always tell anything you look at, an MRI, a CT, they're always as if their feet, their feet were towards you. So this would be the right side, this would be the left side, as if the patient's feet were towards you. This little area here is the hippocampus. CA1 is just an area in the hippocampus especially sensitive to oxygen and glucose deprivation. Okay, here's the lymphatics we're talking about up in the dura. That's the, the meninges, the covering of the brain. This gray matter ribbon around here in the periphery is called the cortex. Cortex means like bark, the bark of a tree. It almost looks like a tree stump, if you will. The cortex is on the periphery of the brain. That's where the cell bodies are of the brain cells, the neurons. These are the deep uh, nuclei where, again, more cell bodies are located for these neurons. I'll show a picture of a neuron in just a moment. This would be the temporal lobe here, the frontal lobe here. So the hippocampus is in the temporal lobe, and that's the most important part of the brain for the memory center. Okay, now here's what happens with the glymphatic system. You've got this yellow stuff is cerebral spinal fluid, and it's sort of like a water helmet. It bathes the entire brain, and the brain floats in it. And the cerebral spinal fluid accompanies the arteries as they penetrate, penetrate into the brain parenchyma. This space around the artery is actually called the perivascular space of Virchow Robin. Perivascular space of Virchow Robin. And again, at night, cerebral spinal fluid will leak out through here. Blood-brain barrier permeability is increased, so cerebral spinal fluid can rinse along the brain parenchyma. 
and these little purple cells are the neurons, and these little uh, black blobs are the neuron waste products that they expel at night. Do you know why they only do this at night? Because they can't go offline in the daytime. I'll show you a picture why, but they've got so many things happening in the daytime with their ionic gradients and their neurotransmitters that they cannot do this at night. It's like Victorian England, you know, they got, let's say, chamber pot, and they dump out their chamber pots, throw them into the street, and then water rinses the um, the waste products away. The waste products actually track through the, periventric, the perivascular space of Virchow ribbon around the vein. And then they will then pass and they'll be absorbed largely in the arachnoid granulations and in some other locations. Okay, the glymphatic system, glial lymphatic system, the brain surrounded by CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. We talked about that. It only runs at night because you got the uh, ionic radiance have to be maintained. This is also why you're a lot smarter in the morning because you because uh, you clean those uh, glymphatics. Okay, now we're going to get into a little more pictures about the glymphatic system. So the yellow stuff is the cerebral spinal fluid floating around the brain. The blue is the venous sinuses, like the superior sagittal sinus. The arachnoid granulations are the little indentations in between, and that's where some cerebral spinal fluid could be reabsorbed. Um, that's one of the locations for it. Here's a neuron. Here's a cell body where the DNA is located. Here's some mitochondria. And then the action potentials typically begin here at the axon hillock, and an axon potential of electrical charge will flow down the neuron to the... Um, the neuronal terminal, axon terminal, and then NT is for neurotransmitter. That'll be released into the synaptic cleft, diffuse across the synaptic cleft. This is the postsynaptic neuron, so this would be the presynaptic neuron. The neurotransmitter then will exert an effect on the postsynaptic neuron. The point that I'm saying is there's a lot of delicate stuff happening here, and that's why neurons cannot go offline in the daytime. About 60, the negative 65 millivolts is the membrane voltage potential in a neuron typically, and also about 65% of the neuron's energy goes to running these sodium potassium ATP uh, pumps, and that's used to pump out calcium. So the point I'm saying is all these little positive charges are really delicate electrical gradients around neurons. So you can't have all this excess cerebral spinal fluid rinsing around and all these waste products rinsing around in large amounts on these neurons in the daytime. They would never be able to function so effectively. And that's why it has to happen at night while you're asleep. Here again is a typical uh, synapse. The neurotransmitter, in this case serotonin, is released. The synaptic vesicle merges with the presynaptic membrane. The neurotransmitter is released. It binds to a receptor on the postsynaptic membrane. And that exerts an effect on the postsynaptic neuron. Then this neurotransmitter is released off the receptor, and it goes back up through a reuptake um, channel in the presynaptic neuron. That's basically a simplified version of how neurotransmission works. Here's a little bit more complicated version. This would be glutamate neurotransmitter, the excitatory neurotransmitter. That's what we talked about in the context of MSG a moment ago. So the glutamate is released. The glutamate diffuses across to the postsynaptic neuron. It'll bind what's called an AMPA receptor. It'll later bind what's called an MND, NMDA receptor, and then there's these subsequent pathways within the postsynaptic neuron. But you get the point. It's rather complex, and you need to have intact neuronal gradients to make all this stuff work. Um, this just kind of showed it again what's happening. Cerebral spinal fluid comes in around the penetrating artery that enters the brain parenchyma. The CSF then has increased permeability at night. It gets past these astrocyte foot processes along the perivascular space of Virchow Robin. The CSF then passes all the way to the perivascular space of Virchow Robin surrounding the, the veins that are in the brain parenchyma. And these little uh, brown spots are the waste products of the uh, neurons. So those are cleared then. So that's how, that's why your brain gets, in a sense, cleaned at night. So you are at your absolute best when you first wake up in the morning. Your hormones are just right for you to do your best thinking. Your neurons are all fresh and clean. So that's why if you're serious about learning something, as soon as you wake up, go right away and immediately study. Uh, do not eat breakfast. Do not work out. I mean, this is if you want the highest level of academic achievement, you have to sit your butt down and study first thing when you wake up. You can exercise later in the day.
okay? Don't get me wrong, there might be times, a lot of times in your life when that's not the highest priority. But if academics is your highest priority, study as soon as you wake up, before you start getting distracted and pulled into other things, before all these other people wake up and start getting you to do stuff for them. You wanna, for your own sake, if you're serious about academics, study as soon as you wake up. Um, all right, so anyways, here's the same thing. Cerebral spinal fluid enters around the penetrating artery. It's in the perivascular space of Virchow Robin. Increased blood brain barrier permeability at night. So it can then open up and allow more cerebral spinal fluid to run along the brain parenchyma, the brain tissue. These are the neurons expelling their waste products. These are rinsed over to the perivascular space of the vein. Perivascular space and perivascular space of Virchow Robin are the same thing. Um, All right, so that's all the slides I got. So that's basically the point. You need to get your sleep so your stress level comes down and you're in a calm and controlled mood the next day. You need to get your sleep so the brain can clean itself and you'll have optimal intellectual function the next day. Your whole body heals better during sleep. And uh, we talked about some things to help it. No caffeine, go to bed early. Um, and put some thought into how you want your room temperature and get all the electronics and the other junk out of your room.